Buenos días. As Dean of the Deusto Law School, I'm delighted to welcome you to this international conference of the Jan Monet Network, in up on European Union Asia Pacific Dialogue, promoting European integration and mutual knowledge across continents. This network aims to, to provide a platform on European Union Asia Pacific relations, but establishing a network of scholars. The project intends to reinforce the mutual knowledge by stimulating joint analysis and research involving not only academics, but also uh, civil society and policy makers in both regions. Our school, the Ustolo School, uh, has always focused on the international dimensions of law, and particularly on European Union law. Deusto established uh, the first Institute of European Studies in Spain in 1979, even before uh, we became a member of the European Union. And I would like to highlight that uh, Deusto was the first university in Spain in which European law was taught. Being a pioneer in this field has allowed Deusto Law School to receive several distinctions from the European Commission with several Jan Monet actions designed to promote excellence in teaching and research in the field of the European Union Studies World War. I take the opportunity today to warmly thank Professor Beatriz Pérez de las Heras, who was director for the European Institute for many years uh, in Deusto, and she is also holder of a Jan Monet chair, also director of the Center of Excellence Jan Monet, and now of this European network, a brilliant career devoted to European studies. I would like to express uh, also my, my gratitude today, not only to her, also to the scholars and the professors of Deusto for the support to achieve this network. They are here today in this conference and to all the members of this network from the university partners. All of you have made possible to build up this network. I know that you have planned many activities in the work plan of the network, such as research activities, different events, research stays in the different countries. I hope that the epidemic situation will be overcome very soon with the vaccination process. And this will be a very success network. I express again this uh, gratitude to you for uh, participating in this online event, which I know it will be a complete success, as I say, although the distance. Uh, and I, now it's the moment to, to give the floor to Professor Beatriz Perez. Uh, and you can start working on the program, which is very appealing. You all are invited to come to Deusto in the next future. It will be a pleasure for me to welcome you here in, in Bilbao. Thank you very much. I have a wonderful conference. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Gemma, for your words and for joining us at the opening of this event. Uh, we know that you are quite busy as the Dean of the School of Law, so we really appreciate your time and your effort for being with us at this moment. And we also thank you for all the institutional support you provide us in this project from the School of Law. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. right. So we are going to start. Good morning to all of those uh, attending from Europe. Good afternoon and good evening to those participating from Asia and Oceania. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for joining us in this event, this international conference on the European Union Asia Pacific Dialogue, fostering synergies on global challenges. Well, this is the first event 
we uh, celebrate within the framework of this European project, uh, which is a Jan Monet network. The title of this uh, Jan Monet network is, uh, the title is very similar to the title of this uh, conference, is the European Union Asia Pacific Dialogue, promoting European integration and mutual knowledge across continents. UNAP is the acronym. Well, this European project, the network, includes five universities, two European, two universities from Europe and three from Asia Pacific regions. Well, these participating universities in this network are the University of News um, of uh, Canterbury in New Zealand, the Toyo University in Tokyo, Japan, Wuhan University in China, the Lund University Giuseppe de Gennaro in Bari, Italy, and the University of Deusto in Bilbao, Spain. Well, this project, the Jan Manet Network, uh, started in 2019 and it will run until 2023. Yeah, it has just been uh, extended for one more year so that we may uh, fulfill, we may carry out all the activities uh, of the work plan, especially those which have been delayed uh, due to the pandemic. Well, there is detailed information about this project in the website of the project, which is indicated in the program of this event. As a, as a very general and brief description of this project uh, uh, in this event, we could say that the John Monet Network is uh, chiefly focused on research activities. Uh, specifically, the network includes several publications, uh, such as the publication of three special issues of three scientific journals, the Asia Pacific Journal of European Studies, we have already published this special issue, um, another special issue of the Australian New Zealand Journal of European Studies, and another issue of the Deusto Journal of European Studies. The project also includes research states of PhD students from partner uh, universities. And to that end, the project awards uh, grants to PhD students. Up to now, uh, five PhD students uh, have been awarded a grant uh, to carry out their research states within the network though they have not yet been able to travel due to the restriction, but we hope that in the second semester of this year, they will be able uh, to move to travel. Well, the project also includes funding for research states of postdoctoral and senior researcher from partner universities. Also, the submission of joint panels and joint papers to the annual conference organized by the European Union Asia Pacific Association. The year the conference will be celebrated in Melbourne, in Australia, at the end of June. And finally, events. Events are also a key activity eh, of this project. And specifically, five events are scheduled, one at each partner university. And this international conference, as I have said, is the first event eh, we celebrate in online format uh, due to the pandemic. Uh, we should have been celebrated in person at the University of Deusto, but they are not uh, suitable conditions for that, unfortunately. Well, as indicated in the program, uh, the event, the conference, will be developed in two days with different dynam dynamics. And, um, today, today, the first day, um, the coordinators of this project in the partner universities uh, will intervene as keynote speakers. Uh, they will first introduce very briefly the universities and then they will address their specific topics. And tomorrow, the second day, is, um, will be dedicated uh, to paper presentation uh, by PhD students and young researchers whose papers have been previously selected uh, among the proposal 
submitted in the call. And finally, in both sessions, at the end, at the end, there will be um, there will be a time for questions and comments eh, from the audience, eh, from the virtual audience. Well, we hope we hope that this event turns up to be very interesting to all of those uh, attending and participating. And we also expect that all of us may may uh, can learn new aspects, new things about the EU. Asia Pacific relations. And with this hope, we start. We start, and I am going to introduce the first speaker from the partner university that is farther away, at least from us, which is the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. And there we have our partner and our colleague, Professor Martin Holland. Uh, that I am, uh, who I am going to introduce very briefly. Well, Professor Holland is the director, is the director of the National Center for Research on Europe at the University of Canterbury. He's also uh, the director of the network of the EU centers in New Zealand. He's holder of uh, of a Jan Monet chair at Persona, and among other merits, uh, I have selected some. Since 2007, uh, he serves as Secretary General of the European Union Studies Association of the Asia Pacific. Well, he's the author of many publications uh, between books, book chapters, articles in scientific journals, uh, publication on EU issues and EU Asia Pacific issues. His research interests are focused uh, on European Union uh, development policy, uh, European Union diplomatic service, EU European Union identity in the Asia Pacific perception of the EU, etc. Well, we appreciate his participation in this conference at this time when in New Zealand is almost uh, seven, uh, a quarter past seven p.m. <laughs> Professor Holland is going to talk about the expectations towards the EU in the Asia Pacific based on the 2020 media reportage of the EU. Martin, thank you very much for being with us and uh, you have the floor. <laughs> uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for those uh, kind words and introduction. And uh, let me thank uh, the hosts because all of us know after one year of uh, unusual conference activities, we know organizing a blended conference, people in person and online uh, actually doubles the work. It's not simpler or more easy. So uh, I thank you personally and, and your team for making this uh, possible. Uh, even though, as you say, it's quarter past seven in New Zealand uh, and I should be enjoying a glass of wine uh, at the moment, but later perhaps we will see. And I will also um, thank your Dean and accept her invitation uh, to come and visit you as soon as uh, travel restrictions allow. Uh, I've uh, never been to Bilbao, so I look forward to that. Um, just a few words uh, about uh, my university, uh, so you can get some context. First of all, uh, I guess by European standards, uh, we're not that old. Uh, we are 147 years old, so we were founded in 1874. Uh, and unfortunately, we're only the second oldest university in New Zealand. Um, uh, Otago is the oldest, but uh, we're soon to be celebrating 150 years. Uh, the um, National Center for Research on Europe, uh, which I founded uh, 20 years ago, um, is still unique within, uh, within New Zealand. Indeed, unique uh, pretty much in Australasia in being an, a center dedicated entirely to the study of the EU in our part of the world. Uh, the Asia Pacific. And as uh, already has been mentioned, uh, I have a Jean Monnet chair, but actually my center, we have three chairs 
and uh, we're a center of excellence. So we are um, a, a, one of the strongest focal points for EU studies uh, in our, our region. And again, as was said, we have many research interests covering EU development policy, uh, in particular public diplomacy, external action service, and probably most famously, uh, our work on perceptions, how the EU's is interpreted in our part of the world. And that's something uh, my center has been doing for nearly uh, the entire 20 years uh, since uh, we were established in the year 2000. And my talk today is going to be based upon a new angle on perceptions where we are looking at, again, how the EU is being understood in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, now, let me uh, share my screen with you. Hopefully, this will prove uh, feasible on my part. Hopefully, you can see that. Not yet. Yes, now. Good. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, I must say that this is a combined paper with my uh, colleague in Guangdong, uh, Dr. Lai, or otherwise known as Cher. And indeed, uh, to be totally honest, she's been the data manager for this project and has produced this uh, colorful PowerPoint. So all of the uh, bells and whistles are down to her as well as anything else. So she deserves uh, more praise than I do, I would say. But as you can hopefully see at the bottom, what I'm going to present to you is a, an, a first year report on our Jean Monnet network which was awarded at the same time as the, as the one uh, that we're currently in conference with. And uh, it is a purely research-based network. Uh, as it says there, the title being Expect, Re Renewal versus Global Disruption. Um, this, let me move on. I apologize for this slide. Uh, this was my own, <laughs> not my colleague's uh, slide, but I just wanted to put that up there to probably be a, a warning, a warning to young graduates and a warning also to senior academics that this, because of the way the Jean Monnet funding cycle works, this project was conceptualized um, nearly two years ago in 2019. Uh, and at the time it seemed really sensible because the EU uh, was still um, coping with Brexit, Trump was still around, Russia has, was continuing and no one had ever heard of COVID-19. So this idea of looking how the EU was responding to global disruption uh, seemed to be an important thing uh, to study. And as you can see there in red, we decided to do this in four, the four most important uh, Asia Pacific societies where the EU is engaged, uh, 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 China, Indonesia, Japan, and Korea. And um, as I've mentioned already, we have nearly 20 years experience in publishing in what are called perceptions, how the EU is reported, uh, but we wanted to change the angle to um, expectations. So not just is the EU being talked about in the media, on social media, uh, but are there actually any expectations that the EU should do anything anymore? Or is it just really gossip, should we say, rather than expectations. So that's the angle we've been looking at. And so this presentation will uh, show you the first years of data we'll be looking at. So as you can see here, hopefully, uh, that we are looking at, gonna be looking at eventually three types of data, traditional media, newspapers, the press, uh, social media analysis in each country, and then in year three, interviewing key informants to find out if there are consistencies in expectations in each of these media or, or whether they're rather uh, discrete or indeed whether old fashioned media is the only one where expectations are really examined or articulated, uh, we will see. So that is uh, the process. So today, we're going to give you a quick overview of year one for traditional media and for social media in these four countries. It's 
I apologize, it might seem a little superficial to begin with, because we want to give you an overview, a big picture thing. But I can assure you that the data set is um, incredibly detailed with, th with hundreds of different variables across each country. And the, and the ability to do micro case studies uh, is something we will be developing over the two years. Importantly, at the bottom, uh, all of this, of course, is in original language. So it's st we study it uh, in uh, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, etc. And then it is all translated into English for comparative purposes. And, and for my understanding, I'm the least multilingual of my team. So that's uh, what we're doing and hopefully what you'll see. These are the newspapers, the traditional newspapers. So the first part I'll talk about will be traditional media, uh, whether that's hard copy or online. And the second part of my presentation will look at social media. But just to give you an idea that uh, these are the types of newspapers we're looking at, we have a certain selection algorithm that will try to make them comparable. Uh, the blanks here for Indonesia and South Korea are simply because we haven't actually finished analyzing the data there. So we haven't included that in this presentation. Um, but in reality, that's what they would look like if you bought the old fashioned form of the newspaper. But of course, we do look at the online facsimile versions uh, as well. So I suppose the to the good news, first of all, whoops, sorry, let's go back. Again, something's gone wrong there. Let me go to this one rather. Visibility, um, only looking at the popular newspapers. So this is, uh, if we look at the sum total of stories in this um, four month period of March, April, May, June of 2020, how much EU news was being reported in the newspapers in each of these countries that we're studying. Um, it's a very crude measure, but it, it gives us an indication of how seriously the EU is taken as a journalistic topic. And pretty much with slight exception of uh, Yomiuri, uh, around about 150 news items in total during that period in the major popular dailies in Korea, in Japan, and, and in China, considerably less uh, uh, in Indonesia. Now, uh, this is pretty much in line with our studies we've done over the last 20 years. We've studied media in China, perhaps on 20 occasions, uh, sorry, on, uh, on, on, on 10 occasions, uh, media in Korea and Japan, probably five or six occasions. So these levels of, of, of reporting are not particularly different uh, in 2020. So that's well, in terms of public diplomacy, might be slightly reassuring. Um, if you look at just the business dailies, which some people say is much more interesting to find news about the EU, we see, again, a typical pattern, but one that distinguishes uh, Japan, where uh, over, over half of the stories found in the Japanese media we're studying are actually in the business paper rather than the popular paper. So that gives, shall we say, a different uh, focus for expectations, business-led expectations on the EU, its role. So again, these are big overviews. Then uh, again, to remind you, the original idea of this project was to see whether Brexit, which had dominated uh, the image of the EU for the previous three years, was still relevant. And uh, this is a fairly clear cut answer. Uh, no, not at all, uh, which is good news, I would say. Slight exception again in Japan, where 20% of stories about the EU concerned Brexit. And again, that was mainly in the business Nikkei uh, publication. Elsewhere, thankfully, uh, reporters were much more interested in things other than Brexit. Although, uh, as we'll see, the thing that they were interested in uh, was COVID rather than Brexit. So a real skew in the data. Again, looking at this is just an example of, of that previous table for Japan. 
again, uh, the number of uh, stories, and as you can see, um, a, a fairly consistent disinterest, you could say, uh, yes, picking up a bit in June when there was discussion of whether uh, the transition period would be extended uh, beyond the end of the year. Uh, so um, that was a, caught the attention of journalists. But again, also coverage of the EU collapsing comparatively in April, uh, again, as COVID stories took up more and more space in newspapers, uh, as well as in coverage of the EU. So this is uh, the shocking reality of how the EU was reported in all of our newspapers. So it's across uh, 16 newspapers that in our data set, which produced 2,150 news stories that mentioned the EU in its story, not exclusively, uh, but at least mentioned the EU. And as you can see, virtually everywhere, it's two thirds or more of stories about the EU were in the context of COVID-19 and usually uh, rather negative connotations as to how the EU was addressing COVID-19. By way of comparison, we did a big study back in 2015, uh, where a similar shadow, shall we say, was on the migration crisis in the Mediterranean. So obviously, newspapers react to what's the popular story. But if you're concerned with public diplomacy and promoting the idea of Europe, uh, this really is problematic because the newspapers only focus on one thing, generally a sensational, problematic thing. Um, centrality, this means how important was the EU in the story? And again, you can see only in Japan, really, were of these 2,150 stories, were they seriously analytical stories involving the EU? Typically, in China, for example, or in South Korea, uh, the EU was just one small part of a story, not the major focus. So not only is it distorted by COVID, uh, generally there's not much in-depth analysis. Um, in terms of the evaluation, and here we're just looking at those stories that were the main focus or secondary, ignoring all of the minor trivial stories, and all of our coders who were uh, trained uh, uh, through rigorously through person-to-person uh, -person, uh, workshops before the pandemic, coded as to whether the image of the EU, the story, as was being conveyed in a was in a critical negative way or a positive way. So again, from a public diplomacy point of view for the EU, uh, highly critical negative coverage uh, taking place in 2020. Um, expectations, this again, I said, is actually the key uh, intellectual idea of our research. We want to see it's not just how many news stories are reported. Uh, that is indeed rather trivial, but we wanted to see within the reporting whether there were any expectations placed upon the EU. Were the writers, uh, were they engaging and requiring, demanding from the EU specific sort of actions? Or was actually the EU really rather irrelevant and dismissed as not being worthy of uh, an expectation from China or Indonesia, Japan or Korea? Just going through, say, from whom here, as you can see, uh, probably the important thing to notice here is this is who was making the expectation. And local here means in China, for example, these were expectations expressed by spokespeople for China towards the EU. Whereas the EU one here is actually expectations by the EU of itself or of its member states. So as you can see, China in particular, lesser so Japan, were actually making demands on expecting the EU to have a certain international role. Uh, elsewhere, well, in Korea, Korea virtually no expectations and very few in Indonesia as well. What were those expectations? And again, here 
is just a table that summarizes them. Uh, each one is, of course, individually unique, uh, but China having the most uh, expectations in its written media to cooperate bilaterally, uh, to cooperate with China on multilateralism, and to make Europe united and prosperous. This is what the Chinese formal written media was expecting the EU to do, the role of the EU. Japan, uh, unite in tackling COVID, safeguard the economy, free movement as soon as possible, and uh, uh, one story uh, uh, on, uh, or a limited number of stories on Brexit. So you can see different types of expectations placed upon the EU, uh, depending upon the country. Now, that's the end of the traditional media. And I know I only have about five minutes to go through the social media, but the same approach was applied. And we chose to look at the EU's own delegations. How, did, how were they projecting themselves? And what did the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in each of these country, how did they reflect uh, the EU's activities, either on Weibo uh, or on Facebook or on Twitter? So it's uh, a quite a complex process, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, just some examples of the missions uh, in Indonesia and Japan uh, that we studied here uh, on, uh, on Twitter. The data, um, activity of EU delegations themselves. So what's the self-image that the EU is trying to create? So the EU delegation in, in Japan, very active, quite active also in China, uh, and fairly moribund in Korea, uh, which was uh, a Facebook. Uh, activity. So different delegations having different levels of social media uh, connectivity. If we look at the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in each of these countries for their equivalent European um, platform, again, you'll see China is very active, uh, Japan not at all, quite surprising. And here, again, paradoxically, the, the South Korean uh, foreign ministry responsible for Europe, very active on their Facebook page in engaging with the EU and uh, Indonesia um, completely absent. So some strange use by either EU delegations or ministries of foreign affairs in conveying uh, their public diplomacy expectations. And again, going back to the original idea of the research of how long would the Brexit shadow be? As this shows, uh, uh, the Brexit shadow on social media that we studied uh, is close to zero. Uh, only four uh, stories were found on the EU delegation to Japan. Nowhere else did any EU delegation actually respond uh, to the question of Brexit, which again might relieve some of us. Uh, they're the stories, we won't go through them now. Um, similarly, um, here look, uh, also, I'll move on for that one as well, if I can. This is interesting in the sense, again, looking at the EU delegation. So all of the social media from the four delegations in the region, 754 social media posts. And as you can see in pretty much everywhere, at least half of the posts were about the EU and COVID-19. So, if all the oxygen for public diplomacy was being taken by this one topic. And therefore, should we say expectations for the EU to have a, a different role as a uh, making the world a better place, development, peace, reconciliation, democracy, human rights, uh, sort of didn't have any space left. It became covered by uh, COVID-19. Um, Similarly here, this is just an example of China and Japan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Again, in China, virtually everything posted by the Chinese ministry concerned the EU and COVID, uh, much less so for Japan, where the other posts were about things with, of the EU, not COVID. But the posts were much, much fewer uh, in that country. And uh, again, evaluation, we looked at these posts either in the foreign ministries or on the EU delegations. And again, obviously, this might be self-fulfilling prophecy here, uh, that very positive uh, posting in terms of not neg never negative messages 
being spent sent even if it's about covid your message can still be on what the eu is doing in a positive way again this is all big picture stuff as i said what we think the eu seems to believe it's doing is creating its own image here and you can see it varies according to delegation whether it's promoting multilateralism or environmental protector or indeed liberal values in Korea and how that transfers uh, to other issues. So this is uh, good news, I suppose, for EU public diplomacy. It's not one size fits all. Brussels decides and every delegation utters the same message despite their location. So these are, if you like, locationally tailor-made uh, images in public diplomacy and setting expectations in public diplomacy. Um, I'm going to go through to the last slide now because I am nearly uh, out of time, just because these are, if you like, some of the general conclusions that the data is starting to generate. I mean, apart from the obvious ones, if you like, uh, of the difference between how the EU sees itself in its public diplomacy and how it's being interpreted by the Asian partners, there's a huge gap in that. Um, and indeed, the dominance of COVID-19 has really distorted any expectations on how the EU might have a better, different role in Asia, something that you know, the global strategy and even von der Leyen have said uh, are indeed priorities. That doesn't seem to have happened. Uh, Brexit, as I've said, fortunately has disappeared. And uh, uh, the difference is at least the delegations do still seem to be talking about the EU as a normative actor of trying to put forward values uh, in many areas, but uh, the social media or traditional media in particular are much more pr pragmatic and look trying to look for clear cut expectations of real action across other areas. Which leads to the last two points there, which I think are the interesting academic points that we might want to think about or write around. Uh, you know, is this what we're finding? Is this tantamount to uh, disinterest simply because of bad timing? Or is it pointing to the irrelevance, increasing irrelevance of the EU to the any agendas in the Asia Pacific? Caused possibly by COVID, but how do you overcome that? Disinterest, you can manage. Irrelevance is a more difficult public diplomacy problem. And then, of course, returning uh, to the stronger Europe in the world, the ambition of uh, von der Leyen's uh, geopolitical commission, uh, it, you'd have to look very hard in our data to find much evidence that is substantive uh, that Europe has gained a stronger Europe in the world or Europe in the Asian world. Um, I'm afraid it's a rather negative conclusion. Thank you. Hopefully I didn't go on too long. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, uh, for this interesting, very interesting analysis eh, about the EU perception and expectation uh, in these four Asian uh, countries. Um, this is a um, at least for me, this is a new and rather unknown aspect for us, the Europeans, eh? that can only be provided <laughs> by a person from the region of Asia, right? We uh, are more familiar with the EU expectation towards Asia Pacific, but not the other way around. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. Let's see I'll, I'll if there sharing. are some, <laughs> some questions or comments from the uh, uh, attendance uh, afterwards about this topic. Thank you. Thank you right. very much. So we move on and now we move uh, from New Zealand to North Asia to, to Japan, uh, where we have another key partner, University, Toyo University. And there we have our colleague and our partner, Professor Ahime Imamura. I am going to introduce him very briefly. Well, Professor Imamura is Professor of Global Entrepreneurship and Global Creativity for Sustainable Innovation. 
at the Department of Global Innovation Studies at Toyo University. Well, um, between 2016 and 2020, he has been serving as chair of the Department of Global Innovation Studies. And also between uh, 2010 and 2020, uh, he has also been, he has been serving as the Toyo University Presidium member in Syriac International. Syriac International is an international scientific organization for research on the public social, uh, on the public, sorry, on the public social and cooperative economy. It's an uh, uh, organization located in Liège, Belgium. Well, uh, presently, Currently, since 2019, he's member of the scientific committee of the Mont Blanc meetings, which is an international forum of the social and solidarity economic entrepreneurs in Paris. And also since 2011, he's the chairman of the labor, labor division of the evaluation committee for incorporated administrative agency within the Japanese Minister of Health, Labor and Welfare. He has been a guest professor at the Faculté de Sciences Économie et de Gestion, the University of Strasbourg in France for some years. And well, his research interests are focused on global social and business entrepreneurship, social enterprise, social and solidarity economy. His author, his author of many publications on these issues. Well, Professor Imamura is going to talk about the EU and Japan collaboration on entrepreneurial and creative mindset human resources promotion through sustainable development goals and society 5.0. Thank you very much for joining us. Ahime, at this time in Japan is, uh, is a quarter to 5 p.m., right? So thank you and you have the floor. You may, you can open the microphone, right? Thank you, <laughs> thank you Beatrice. Uh, thank you so, thank you very much for so many uh, introductions and thank you very much. And I'm very happy to be able to join this and uh, uh, I'm a very much uh, 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 love, fall in love in Bilbao, <laughs> and uh, I visited Bilbao. I don't know, three times or four times already. And uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, Toyo University, have an international exchange agreement with Deusto University, and also we have a connection with the Mondragon University, Mondragon Team Academy project. Because of that, uh, as uh, Beatrice uh, introduced me, that as uh, uh, I'm teaching a global entrepreneurship and uh, a global creativity for innovation. So MTA is a very good partnership for our education and research too. So uh, let me share my PowerPoint uh, here. I'm not sure if I can do this well. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, okay. yes. Sorry, it's just I was... Yes. Uh, okay. Is it uh, on the full screen or? No, it's not full screen. But, ah. um, okay, just a moment. Yes. I should. Just a moment. Uh, okay, so I will. Let me read again. Yes. Just a moment. No, I'm just uh, trying to uh, make my presentation more uh, easy to yeah. read while my presentation, just a moment. Uh, sorry. Okay. And, okay. Okay, now you can see that in the full screen. Yes. We can see okay. the screen. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, my presentation is a little bit different from the, uh, uh, the previous uh, presentation. I'm just uh, uh, more uh, based on the uh, entrepreneurship or personal point of view. 
especially uh, very simply saying that we have learned very much from European citizenship education or some uh, entrepreneurship uh, mindset training programs. So uh, this time I'd like to introduce that how Japan will be uh, <clears throat> benefited from this uh, collaboration with the European Union and uh, a Japanese economy having a program of the power of innovation. So let me see this. Uh, so I don't know uh, if uh, Tokyo Olympic will be uh, uh, executed or not, but uh, uh, this is uh, the picture of the Tokyo torch. Tokyo torch is not yet uh, finished, but uh, uh, this is uh, some sort of the iconic story of Japan changed from its uh, uh, traditional bureaucratic uh, uh, management system to more horizontal participatory democratic decision-making system. I think that basically you have learned from the European way of the uh, democratic participation decision-making systems. Why? So uh, uh, let me introduce our uh, educational principle that uh, our keyword is travel play dialogue. And uh, this is uh, to, uh, to visit especially European uh, innovative cities like Bilbao. And uh, we uh, expect the student to, to have a communication with the, the local creativity people. And then the, uh, I'd like to uh, explain the play is a, some later, but uh, proper play dialogue is our basic principle and basically learn from Europe. And as you know that uh, Japan is also locked down since uh, uh, last year, uh, very sometime. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, this is a strangeness of the Japanese society. It's something like uh, there's no enforcement of law to uh, prohibit from the, uh, uh, say, uh, the stay at home. Uh, this is a very much voluntary based uh, uh, request from the government, but uh, it worked. It worked. This is a past history. Now it's a, we still have a program, but uh, so uh, I'd like to do uh, my research work with this uh, project is that uh, how uh, European people and the Japanese or Asian people consider that the public space and uh, the comparison between the public space idea between Europe and Asia and Japan could be an uh, interesting way to analyze. Especially I put forward for this uh, uh, hypothetical uh, keyword, creative public space design. This is also gives us that, uh, will give us some solution from the post COVID-19 uh, creation of the neighborhood uh, proximity uh, way of the uh, global collaboration. So I will, I will explain very briefly later. But so uh, um, so uh, how to design the creative public space is our keyword. And uh, our aim of education in our department is that the entrepreneurship, which are very much uh, uh, serious mindset of the public space. Why I we put up uh, hit upon the idea of the public. So please look at this. Uh, so the public idea in European people and Japanese people are completely different. So this is a comparison of the dictionary explanation between the uh, English dictionary and the Japanese dictionary. So in the long run. Contemporary dictionary, they explain that the public is that they do not work on the government or who do not work for the government or do not have important jobs. Something like uh, uh, more popular citizenship uh, kind of the concept. But in Japan, uh, the public, we Japanese say ko or kokyo, this is at the com uh, uh, almost contrary to that. So imperial court, government office, and nation, and official, and the society, the real world, or whatever. So this is much more bureaucratic, top-down kind of idea. And uh, this is a picture uh, uh, we took uh, last year, no, no, not last year, two years before, uh, the Rugby World Cup. This is an Ireland rugby supporter. So Ireland rugby supporter, uh, uh, that uh, the, the catch, the Japanese policeman, 
and uh, they moved up the Japanese policeman uh, onto uh, the group. But uh, what, which is the public? I think that the European people consider that the, the uh, rugby supporter is a public, but the Japanese people consider policeman is a public. This is a very much uh, uh, significant different idea of the uh, public concept between Europe and Japan, especially that in England, public school is not a public, but a, a private school. So uh, this is so the, our starting point of this uh, uh, way is that the public concept. And also this uh, relates to the uh, conceptualization of the entrepreneurship. So uh, as I told you before in the beginning that the Japan is facing the problem of the recovering its uh, innovation, innovative power, because the, uh, Japan was a very much successful in the, in the age of 1970s or 1980s before the uh, outburst of the uh, bubble. So uh, Japan lost its innovative power because of the too much success of the uh, before uh, bubble economy. So uh, we started to compile the global innovation index or ranking, uh, comparing that uh, about uh, uh, 60 or more countries by uh, aggregating some indexes. So we have five axes. Uh, one is the international harmonization, harmonization and uh, trade freedom and uh, environmental focuses. And the second axis is that the market situation and uh, some, so uh, uh, there are some market conditions and uh, uh, investment or startups or something. And then the, the third uh, one is that the technological innovation. And fourth one is a human power. I think the human power is a really important aspect for us. So human capital, education, and income inequality and diversity and smart power. And then the last one is a relate, uh, related power is the political stability and financial capability and uh, tax or some other uh, institutional or social systems. And uh, this is a very quick uh, comparison of the result uh, based on the five axes. And uh, we compared, uh, compared the Singapore, United States, Germany, China, and Japan. And uh, uh, you see that Singapore is the number one ranking of this uh, global innovation ranking, and the shape is very much balanced. But uh, uh, China and the US is something like a more concentrated on technology. And what Japan is, uh, this one inside, that uh, the serious problem of Japan is a human power. So uh, Japanese human power among those five nations is the lowest and uh, we have a very serious problem of the human power. And then, sorry, and uh, what is the problem of our human power is that uh, here, uh, like uh, Japanese people uh, have, very, sorry, uh, here, uh, that share, sh uh, share of the student who want to work in their own business, so startups. So this is the lowest here. And then, uh, the education is basically good, but the diversity, especially for the here, here, the, uh, the labor force participation rate female or female uh, share of the employment in the managerial positions and percentage of female numbers of uh, parliament here, around here is the lowest compared to those countries. So this is our starting point of how we can uh, create uh, by comparing from other countries, especially Europe, uh, to change our innovative uh, ecosystem. So as you may know very well that the Japanese employment system is based on the one-shot recruiting system and the lifetime employment. So this is the cause of the uh, problem of the uh, less innovative uh, management system or human resource systems. So uh, this is because of the, that's, I will explain very quickly that this is a pyramid type and the lifetime employment and the internal labor market uh, management is a Japanese problem. And also uh, this is a comparison between Europe and Japan. So Japan is a more bureaucratic top-down communications like X type. And Europe is more horizontal uh, dialogue and very equal footing communications like uh, 
you, EU says that the dialogue and compromise, so you are always trying to dialogue and uh, uh, goes into the uh, compromise or some sort of the agreement. So this is a comparison between Europe and Japan. So this is that the Japanese people are avoid confrontation and uh, emotionally unexpressive here, Japan and Korea is very close to that. And then that uh, Israel, uh, France, Spain and Italy is around here. So emotionally expressive and uh, confrontational. So uh, we consider this kind of the less uh, uh, expressive way of the communication is a Japanese program for future innovation. And also Japan is not a good uh, 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 interest for the foreign investors into Japan. So uh, foreign investors think that the Japanese market is very much uh, wonderful, but uh, they consider that the Japanese human power is a very much serious problem, especially lack of human resources with foreign language ability and difficulty in finding experts. So uh, that uh, basically, including Europe, they consider Japan as a good market for selling their products and services, but they consider Japan as a good partnership for the real business uh, operations because of the lack of the uh, enough uh, human resources as a partnership. So uh, we, so I'd like for, so time is limited. So let me think that very briefly that uh, we cons compared the, uh, the Silicon Valley and uh, Route 128. This is an East Coast type. And Japan is a very much similar to this uh, bureaucratic type uh, business models. And uh, we are lacking of this kind of the communities of the uh, diversity uh, talents. And uh, so this is the Japanese uh, uh, type of the uh, top-down bureaucratic organizations. We have to change this organization uh, prototype to more di uh, horizontal or diversity-oriented uh, communications. So uh, this is our basic idea. This is learned from the Ashose Montreal, Montreal Business School. And they propose that uh, Japan is very good at upper graph, big businesses, and also there are very nice uh, startups in Japan, but there are no uh, good uh, connection or uh, in intermediary in, ja in Japan. So uh, we think that this is a very important point of the communicating and creating the, the innovative peoples. So uh, this is, so I will upload uh, soon, but please read it uh, very quickly. So this is a kind of the image of the, this is a cluster. Don't worry, this is not a COVID-19 cluster, but uh, we are considering this kind of the horizontal, flexible, diversified network. So uh, this is some sort of the uh, modular architecture and integral architecture. Japan is very much good at integral architecture and, uh, and the very much closed innovation. But the now is a time for the modular type architecture and open innovation. So why? We are interested in Europe. This is a Mondragon cooperatives in uh, Bilbao, uh, Basque, and uh, they have some sort of the cooperative government structures based on the uh, democratic participatory uh, structures. And uh, sorry, this is sorry, this is a, a, the stock company. Sorry, this is a normal stock company, and shareholders uh, occupies the organization. But this is Mondragon type. So. Uh, they are uh, that uh, the only that the basic government structure of the Mondragon is a cooperative is a participatory democracy. And this is a very uh, interesting point for us to learn. And the General Assembly and together all the membership is that uh, uh, discussed in this General Assembly. And also we learn from the idea of the Northern European countries and the co-production, democratic participation and uh, participating the public service production from the citizenship. So uh, this is uh, some, uh, uh, so uh, this is some uh, result from the, the Swedish uh, comparison that the cooperative type uh, production is a very much satisfactory and uh, also the working people are very much satisfied. 
And then this is a picture of the uh, visual image education in the, uh, the, some, uh, this is Östersund, uh, the middle Sweden, and I visited there. And then the, uh, the, the very much citizen participation to the uh, public service provision is really uh, uh, <clears throat> strong. And then they say that nothing is impossible to solve the social problems. And also uh, in France, uh, you created that uh, the social solidarity economy law in 2014. So this also invites the citizenship uh, uh, empowerment, uh, enrollment to the public service provision. And also uh, the, this is uh, the, uh, the, we are very much interested in the service of general interest in the EU. And uh, this is something like a bottom-up, more democratic idea of the uh, uh, some public interest services. So, uh, so all services in Japan are designed and provided by top-down bureaucratic uh, organization. But the Europe is very interesting that uh, they create a bottom-up participatory and sometimes they have to uh, compromise, but the, the democratic dialogue process is very much interesting for us. So uh, there are many ways of the creation. And uh, uh, this is some sort of the uh, SGI Service of General Interest Framework in EU in 2011. So we have been much interested in this uh, activities in EU. But uh, contrary to that, in Japan, we have a failure of the coordination of the governmental policy and local community initiatives. And uh, I will skip very briefly that, uh, uh, sorry, I put so many uh, PowerPoint, but I will so, uh, I'm sure I will upload and send at least this PowerPoint. And uh, so what is a citizenship? Japanese citizenship is very much weak and initiative is very weak. So we have to learn from Europe. And uh, so uh, the citizenship education, especially in Sweden or uh, Northern European countries and uh, also in Holland, Netherlands uh, is uh, very much interesting. So uh, how we can create a dial by the uh, citizen initiatives is really uh, our interest. So uh, this is also the peaceful education programs in Netherlands. We did a research on that. So. Uh, time is limited, so four minutes or something. So travel, play, dialogue, I introduced that. So we started to educate Japanese young people more uh, competent in the uh, innovative activities. So this is at, uh, yes, this is Bilbao and Florence and the student visit to uh, Europe and the train to be a creative socioeconomic values and teamwork entrepreneurial mindset and international business culture. And uh, we did this kind of communication with the European entrepreneur or business peoples and cooperative peoples. And then they got that uh, responsive, brave and positive mindset. This is one way of uh, our education. The second is play. And this is that we invite a Japanese actress in uh, working in the, on the stage in London and we did uh, some uh, communication skill training for Japanese people using uh, English uh, uh, communication exercise. So, uh, so this is some reaction from the student and they are very much confident in speaking English dialogue. So this is one next challenge of the play challenge. And also we do a creative business communication platform named a Kaya Toyo, Creativity Toyo program, pro program. And we invited Silk Sorry, the circus uh, production and other big business people from other abroad and uh, Japanese students are enjoyed very much for communication with this. And uh, they are very much satisfactory for this. So uh, what is a way of uh, recovering Japanese economy after COVID-19? So we put our emphasis on communicative ability of Japanese young people. Traditionally, they are very much hesitate and very much uh, passive to do a communica uh, communication. So uh, this is the innovation ecosystem and one of the I put from this uh, uh, on the internet. And uh, we try to start the design thinking processes and uh, 
this is a society five all. This is a kind of the concept of the technology and uh, uh, citizenship, uh, society, social life is go hand in hand. And uh, this is not uh, some sort of the uh, technology oriented the policy. And uh, we introduce a more social aspect in our technology policy. And uh, we try to using the technology to comfort high quality lives and vitality and uh, then the COP is a digital transformation. And uh, this is a uh, society 5.0 is aimed at uh, to achieve the SDGs. So we try to contribute to the that uh, global uh, social economy, uh, sorry, uh, economy and society. And uh, finally, this is the end of my presentation. And uh, as uh, this is a way of comparison that Japan is created, Tokyo is created as a capital at uh, 1603 from the Tokugawa shogunate. And uh, this is a very much top down uh, kind of creation, but uh, this is remaining still in current Japan. So this is, uh, let me introduce that this is a very much iconic, typical uh, change before COVID-19 and after COVID-19. So this is left hand side is that uh, the high skyscraper construction model before COVID-19. This is a closed top down and very much non-human like uh, aspect. But the right hand side is this, they changed the design of this uh, Tokyo Abashi project into right hand side. You see that there are more open and uh, human aspect is included because uh, that uh, the architect in Japan uh, notified that, uh, that that you have created the closed and crowded and close contact settings and then we found that the in Japanese tradition that uh, they said we have a very much uh, excellent airflow construction and then uh, we arrived so this is a very similar you see that uh, we have a tra in our tradition that uh, the more uh, Flow, airflow and creative uh, way of uh, change. So this is a Tokyo torch. And uh, so I think that, uh, I'm sorry that this is the exact comparison between EU and Japan, but uh, uh, I would like to propose that uh, creative public space design learned from the European civil society uh, construction uh, with the combination of the digitally uh, uh, advanced technology. And uh, we are trying to co-create with European and Asian and other countries uh, for more uh, human-centered uh, technology. So that's our aim of this project. But uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I have not yet so much uh, concrete uh, comparison or statistical analysis, sorry. But that's all from my side. From my side, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ahime, for this lecture full of data, relevant data, chiefly about Japan, <laughs> the Japanese concept of the public, of the ecosystem, innovation ecosystem, etc. Will you send us? Uh, will you send us the yes. PowerPoint because there are too many slides and we have yes, sorry, yes, time yes. to read all of them, right? Okay. So, sorry. Well, maybe you. we shall come back on some of these aspects in the debate if there are some questions or comments from the Thank audience. You. Ahime, um, in a in one minute, in one minute uh, or two minutes, uh, would you please introduce a little bit um, Tojo University, um, your university, just a little bit, huh? so that all of us may know uh, this a little bit, your university, Tojo. Yes, uh, Tojo University is located in the center of Tokyo, <laughs> and uh, we have uh, 135 years of establishment. Mm. And uh, the, this is created from the philosopher. Uh, Enrio in a way is a philosopher. That's uh, we uh, put emphasis on the more on philosophy, but uh, this is a very unique philosopher. He traveled a lot all over the world, three uh -huh. times the global travel. And also he traveled Japan for uh, lecturing the Japanese citizens. Mm -hmm. So inheriting this uh, DNA, so we are trying to start up this uh, global innovation study department to revive the traditional concept into modern Japanese society. So 
we have a many wide variety of the faculties and uh, 44 departments or something. So uh, except for the medical science, but uh, I think that uh, we welcome almost all kinds of the researchers into our university and the location is very convenient. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we are very much, uh, uh, you know that the, the quality ranking of the education in Japan is also very much harsh. And uh, uh, because of this uh, global innovation study department, uh, Toei University improved their position in <laughs> Japanese uh, university competition. So I think that uh, we are uh, upward moving, more uh, uh, established or kind of the well-known uh, university. And we are very much active and dynamic. Thank you. Very well, very well, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ahime, uh, for your intervention. Right, so now we, we travel from Japan to China, uh, where we have uh, Guhan University, another key partner in this uh, network, in this project. And then we greet our colleague, uh, Professor Fan Shatom. Uh, I am going to introduce him very briefly also. Well, uh, Dr. Fan Shatom is professor. Uh, is professor at the School of Political Science and Public Administration at Wuhan University in China, where he's also executive director of the Center for Economic Diplomacy. He also serves as a member of the Advisory Committee for Economic and Trade Policy at the Chinese Minister of Commerce. Uh, in fact, between uh, 2004 and 2010, he served as uh, at the Chinese mission to the European Union in Brussels. Well, his major research interests are focused on economic diplomacy, geopolitics, and European studies. And he's the author, he's the author of many publications on these issues. Well, Professor Fang is going to talk about the open regionalism, China's Belt and Road Initiative, linking up with regional organizations in Europe and Asia uh, Pacific. So Tom, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, at this time in Wuhan is uh, four. a quarter past 4 p.m., <laughs> right? So you have the floor. Thank you. We listen thank to you. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, it's um, a great pleasure uh, for me um, to talk about um, on the EU China connectivity. Um, let me see how I can. Um, so sorry, I don't have um, the uh, the PPT. So I, I'm going to. Problem. Yeah. Well, um, you know, as Beatrice kindly introduced, uh, I'm from Wuhan University, and uh, Wuhan is the epicenter of COVID nineteen. Um, so we, we know it was a very difficult uh, moment when it happened, when it broke out uh, in, in Wuhan city. Um, Wuhan city has a population of uh, 10 million people. Um, and uh, 1 million are students. So, so Wuhan city has the largest number of, uh, of students in the world. So it has a lot of universities. Uh, one of them is uh, Wuhan University, which I honored um, to serve for, for eight years, from 2012 to uh, 2020. Um, so I think that it's a um, great honor uh, for me to represent Wuhan University to, to talk here about uh, uh, EU-China uh, connectivity efforts. Uh, we know that uh, China is the EU's biggest trading partner in 2020. The US is the second um, biggest trading partner for EU. Uh, and EU is China's second largest trading partner, uh, only after ASEAN. So we are having very close 
uh, economic and trade uh, relationships. Uh, however, um, the political relationship between China and the EU uh, is turning sour uh, because of uh, issues like uh, relating to uh, Xinjiang Autonomous Region, uh, relating to Hong Kong, uh, relating to Tibet. Um, and China views these issues as uh, sovereignty issues. Um, that means uh, China has no room uh, for maneuver or, or compromising. Um, so we are seeing a dichotomy between economics and the politics between China and the European Union, uh, which is unfortunate. When I worked as trade uh, attaché uh, in the Chinese mission to the European Union in 2004 and 2010, um, our political relationship between China and EU uh, is generally, was generally good. We were having a honeymoon. Uh, since 1995 until 2005. But after that, because of all kinds of reasons, our relationship is getting uh, more and more uh, difficult. Um, the, 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 so there, there, there remains a puzzle. So why there is a, um, a gap between economics and politics? Uh, is that all uh, due to uh, China's political system? Or, or due to uh, use emphasis of, uh, of uh, values, or there's something um, bigger. Um, I think there are some, 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 some voices which is a little bit uh, distracting. Um, let's, let's, let's me, no, I am going to call them. Don't worry. So, so there, there is such a, a, a puzzle. I think that we need to uh, understand uh, why there is such a puzzle. Is something within uh, China EU's domestic systems, or is something uh, beyond? Something IR researchers prefer to call it systemic uh, variables. So I think that. There exists both uh, that contribute to this puzzle. I want to emphasize um, today's world is uh, very different from the world we were familiar with. Um, there is something that I would uh, call uh, new realism for describing today's world's uh, politics and economics. So we are not, no longer uh, uh, in a very harmonious political and, and, and economic uh, relationship. Politically, we are seeing more and more geopolitics, um, like uh, in, 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 in Europe, uh, the, the new European Commission um, labeled herself as a geopolitical commission. So I think this is a very interesting sign of geopolitics is coming back. Uh, the European Union doesn't want to be a playground um, of big or great powers. The European Union wants to have its own strategic autonomy, wants to have its own uh, strategies maneuvering, maneuvering uh, in today's uh, new, more and more realist uh, world. Um, and China's BRI is more and more a Belt and Road Initiative is increasingly perceived as a ge geopolitical tool. Uh, whereas Chinese policymakers uh, wants to avoid uh, that BRI is being labeled as a geopolitical tool. Um, and in, in the United States, uh, we were seeing the dark days of, of Trump administration. Uh, practicing unilateralism, uh, bullying, um, you know, or, or bad memories, and 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 COVID nineteen. So the world is experiencing um, economic uh, recession. So this is something I would call uh, new realism of world's politics. 
And economically, I'm seeing more and more competition among economies. Um, people are talking about uh, reducing strategic dependencies. People are talking about uh, autonomy. People are talking about uh, vulnerabilities of the supply chains. These narratives were not so familiar when, when I was in Brussels or, or, or compared with uh, 10 years ago. So we are now experiencing what I call uh, competitive interdependence. So geopolitics plus competitive interdependence are now making the world becoming a neo-realist world, which is very different from a neoliberal world or, or liberal institution, institutionalism uh, back in 1990s. Um, of course, there are different uh, ideologies, different political systems, different cultures. Um, we know that uh, EU emphasizes very much on, on human rights, uh, on labor rights, on environment. And uh, that, I think that uh, the EU's perception of these core concepts is very different from China's understanding of these concepts. Very different from, when China talk about human rights, China emphasize the right to develop, the right to get richer, the right to get bigger house, better life. Uh, so in other words, um, China emphasized a lot on the materialist improvement of human lives. Whereas the EU emphasized a lot on um, something more soft, something uh, relating to people's minds. So I think there, there's a big difference. Um, well, I, I want to give you a few um, case, case studies that can make us better understand why there is such a puzzle, why there's such a dichotomy between economics and politics in EU-China uh, relationship. Um, this example is the EU-China Bilateral Investment Treaty Negotiation, the EU-China BIT, uh, which I experienced as a, a negotiator. Um, I think it's, it's very interesting if we go back to the origin of this EU-China BIT. I think that the EU, the European Commission officials approached me uh, back in 2009 when, when Lisbon Treaty was ratified. Uh, the EU uh, wanted to negotiate with China a standalone investment treaty. Why? Because the investment, the FDI, foreign direct investment, has become a new competence for the European Union. It used to be the competence of member states. For example, Germany signed a lot of uh, bilateral investment treaties with, with individual countries outside the European Union. Uh, between EU member states and China, we have over 20 bilateral investment treaties. So why bother to negotiate a EU-China BIT, right? Because the EU-China BIT emphasize a lot on market access, on investment liberalization, uh, on something what we call pre-establishment national treatment and the negative list. Uh, so there's something new that beyond the traditional FDI competence, which was owned mainly by member states. So the EU um, wants to have a new BIT. And China said, yes. We said, yes, we want what we wanted. So that's why we finally launched the BIT negotiation in 2012 or the beginning of 2013. So I think that was the origin of the EU-China BIT. And we put more and more things into this EU-China BIT, including uh, business interests, market access, open more and more markets on both, direct, in both directions. We put inside a negative list model, 
we put inside uh, pre-establishment national treatment, we put in place environmental standards, we put in place label, lab, uh, labor standards. The EU side wants, to, wants China to join some new conventions of ILO that relates to uh, forced labor. Uh, China said, we first ratify this uh, BIT, then we work together to move towards uh, that direction. I think that we, we finally struck a, a compromise. But unfortunately, because of the sanctions uh, imposed on China and China's um, anti-sanction uh, moves, basically happening on the same day, March 22nd, uh, we saw that the EU-China BIT got stuck in the European Parliament. So this is something we need to explain why it happened. Because we can see that the EU's concerns are multifold, are multifold. On the one hand, the EU wants to have its own business interests, have more, more, more market access in Chinese market, similar case for China. But on the other hand, the EU wants to uh, have China to be committed to something called sustainable development clauses, including human rights, environmental standards, uh, labor standards, and etc. And during this uh, process of negotiation, we see more and more elements put into uh, this EU-China BIT. So I'm just wondering uh, how heavy this BIT turns out to be. So in, in today's neorealist world, we have too many concerns. We have business concern, we have a human rights concern, we have an environmental concern. We burden ourselves with too much. We, want, we burden our trade negotiation with too many elements. For the EU side, trade is not just trade. Trade is trade plus. Trade is everything. Trade is human rights, trade is the environment, trade is international institutions, trade is, uh, is carbon, trade is, uh, it should be green. Uh, on the Chinese side, uh, we say yes and no. We say trade is trade. We can accommodate trade plus, but we cannot accommodate politicalization of trade. So I think that can explain the, uh, the, the dilemma we are now faced with. The second case study uh, is the, um, the something what I call competing connectivity projects, competing connectivity projects. So we, we, we know that China launched the Belt and Road Initiative back in 2013, basically nearly 10 years ago. And uh, that was largely a response to American Asia pivot back in 2009. Um, and now we see the world's having more and more versions of uh, of connectivity projects, right? The EU uh, launched the EU Asia Connectivity Strategy in 2018. And uh, recently, the Council um, issued the Council conclusions and pushing forward uh, EU version of Indo Pacific strategy. And, and the United States issued the Indo Pacific strategy during Trump days. And India. Southeast Asia, uh, ASEAN, Japan, um, Indonesia, all have uh, their own versions of connectivity projects. And now Biden administration is uh, making huge investments uh, on, on infrastructure. I mean, ideally, these connectivity projects should be complementary to each other because nobody can single-handedly address the issue of connectivity, right? Um, that, that requires trillions and trillions of, of, of dollars. Nobody can do that single-handedly, uh, in particular in the difficult moment of economic recession globally. So ideally, it should be um, 
complementary connectivity. But unfortunately, we are seeing competing connectivity. I think uh, this is probably due to the globally, we are now in economic recession, we're experiencing difficult uh, days of, of due to COVID-19. So the, so the new realism of today's world politics economics, a new paradigm of today's world politics economics, giving us headaches, twisted the economic logic, twisted the market logic and make it everything, make everything geopolitical logic, right? So, so the world is turning into a mess and we have responsibility to, to clean up this mess, right? I think that's the value. Uh, of Beatrice um, Jean Monnet uh, project. So we're hoping these competing connectivity projects can, can become uh, complementary connectivity projects and turning uh, our world into a better world. Um, I think I should stop here. I, uh, I do hope uh, we can create epistemic community linking up Europe and Asia Pacific that contribute to policy making um, in Asia Pacific and Europe. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shatan, for this uh, uh, complete, very complete and very clear analysis about the relations between EU and China with these perspectives opened by the um, Belt and Road Initiative. Is, is implementation is a real challenge eh, for both regions in many aspects, eh, connectivity, sustainability, the trade, etc. Eh? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we share your good wishes for both regions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, finally, finally, we return to Europe. Close to us, we have another partner, the LUM University, Giuseppe De Gennaro. And there we have our colleague and partner, Francesco Alicino, who represents uh, his university in this event. I'm going to introduce him very briefly as well. Uh, Professor Alicino. Uh, Francesco Alicino is full professor in public law, religion, and constitutional law. Uh, he also holds important academic responsibilities at the LUM University. He's the director of the School of Law and he's vice rector for teaching activities. Uh, outside the university, he also has important responsibility as a member uh, at the Italian Council of the for the relationship with Muslim communities within the Italian Home Affairs Ministry. He's professor at the Mislan of the School of Government in Louis University in Rome, and a member of the Institute of San Pio the Five in Rome. Well, he has uh, participated and is still participating in several international research projects like this one. And he's the author of many publications, books, articles, uh, having been published in Italian, French, and English. Well, Professor Alicino is going to talk about uh, a real global challenge, uh, such as, such as yeah, it is the prevention of the terrorist threats in the EU and Asia Pacific regions. Is there a potential for Profitable collaboration. Uh, Francesco, buongiorno. Thank you very much for being with us, and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Beatriz. Um, it's uh, a great honor to be here, um, and uh, thank you also uh, all the organizers for very this very interesting uh, international conference. I will also thank uh, my colleague uh, Francesco Ricci which is uh, responsible for a UNEP project here, here at Lume University, which is based in Apulia region. This university, you know, in Apulia region, which is, uh, uh, you know, the extreme part of the Italy on the, on the hill, uh, which has, uh, as the Washington Post uh, 
wrote just one year uh, ago is uh, considered one of the beautiful uh, region in the world so you can come and uh, visit this region in order to understand if uh, this is true um, it's a relative uh, young uh, and small a small uh, university which uh, was founded in the late uh, 90s, uh, of course, of the last uh, century, uh, but is very active in, uh, in the field of uh, uh, fields of uh, law, economics, and now engineering, engineering and uh, medicine. The university is uh, rooted in uh, regional, uh, in the regional territory, but uh, um, uh, for uh, many, uh, with uh, many other collaboration, national, international collaboration. For this reason, the uh, university is able to play a very important role in the region, in the field of the teaching, research, and what is called in Italy the third mission, uh, meaning uh, um, the, to generate uh, knowledge outside the academic uh, environments. Uh, if I'm allowed, uh, I would invite uh, a research professor and student uh, to come here, and uh, you know, uh, it will be uh, profitable for. Uh, for our uh, for our project and for uh, for uh, the uh, the research, um, so let me share um, the the screen. I have some slides uh, which are not uh, as appealing as the my previous uh, uh, previous speaker. Can you hear me and the slide? Can you see the slide? Yes, yes, we can see. Perfect. So as you can appreciate from the title. Uh, the subject uh, is not particularly enjoyable it's, uh, it's very uh, it's very huge so let me um, apologize in advance uh, because i won't be able to analyze in depth all, uh, all the aspects this is only an overview and uh, you know um, it will be appear in some in many sense superficial uh, in fact the the choice of uh, this uh, subject uh, um, was uh, uh, was essentially due uh, to the international relevance uh, of uh, uh, terrorism, its uh, pervasive, uh, ubiquitous, uh, and worldwide presence, which also reflects its global nature, meaning its uh, simultaneous occurrence of both uh, universalizing and the particularizing tendency in contemporary social, political, and legal system around the world. In this sense, the emergency of terrorism it's very similar, you know, to that of the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak. In fact, these two problems have underscored the importance of more intensive collaboration, not only among the European states, but also between this part of the world and other, other continents, including Asia-Pacific uh, region. Uh, however, the collaboration should not be an end in itself, as you know, which also explains the second part of the title of the presentation that, for the same reason, needs to be clarified. With the, this paper, I'm not uh, referring to the general phenomenon of terrorism. Uh, that's almost impossible to do in a few minutes. My attention is focused on the specific mm. form of religion inspired terrorism which remains one of the most localized problem even though its media coverage has been limited during the last year during the pandemic emergency it does not mean that the so-called islamic terrorism has become less aggressive and threatening the impression my impression is that it's on standby and ready to erupt as soon as the COVID emergency will reduce its uh, uh, impact. Under this aspect, uh, it should be noted that the Islamic terrorism has a different uh, impact on uh, Asia Pacific uh, states. Uh, in Australia, for example, the, tra the strategy to prevent and contrast the militant and violent religious uh, radicalization has been uh, comprehensive and involved huge legislative. Uh, changes which somehow have affected the protection of constitutional rights. But if the majority of Australians are unhappy about this, it appears only because they do not believe that the state, the Australia, uh, Australia has gone far enough in this field. 
Um, New Zealand, on the other hand, has observed the rise of the global or international terrorism from a distance, um, although it has been part of some international moves against it. This is because given the internal, some internal factor, including factors, including the geographical position, no external driving terrorist events have occurred on New Zealand soil until now. In this case, the terrorism, uh, terrorism threats continue to be domestically orientated, so they continue to be treated as a normal criminal offenses without any religious connotations. Um, so these cases uh, enable to focus another important indicator. Despite the common ideological matrix, religion-inspired terrorism manifests, as you know, as I said, in uh, different ways. This depends not only on the local factors, but also on the policies adopted by the government to prevent and uh, contrast the terrorist threats. That's uh, even more evident in the fact that in both Europe and the Asia Pacific region, the states do not share a common understanding of Islamic terrorism, as, as I said, the religious, religion based or inspired terrorism, which also reflects that they are different approaches in considering, in considering the relation between Islam as a religion, religion based violent radicalization, and religion inspired terrorism. For example, um, the European Union identifies the violent radicalization in those behaviors that uh, aim at, quote, glorifying and justifying terrorism as well as those acts that aim at disseminating messages or images online and offline as a way to gather uh, support for terrorist uh, causes uh, or to seriously intimidate the population, end quote. On the contrary, in China, the definition of violent religion inspired radicalization is uh, highly politicized and based on dichotomy between good and bad Muslims. The national and the local authorities consider moderate on a genuine Islam something that uh, should be tolerated, while political Islam should be separated from the former and uh, rejected by society. In order to do that, Chinese authorities adopt a legal strategy involving four essential steps. First, the state lists normal religious activities while labeling uh, others uh, as illegal religious activities. The example is given by the legal document regulating uh, 75 manifestations. Uh, this is the title of the document, Manifestation of the Religious Extremist uh, Activities, uh, which also includes a catalog of religious practices uh, that are due to be approved by the public authorities. Then the states, uh, the authorities, um, advocate uh, um, various uh, cultural activities uh, to counteract what the state itself considers signs of radicalization. At the same time, public authorities uh, encourage Muslims to consume cultural products made up and promoted by the state itself, even though they might be appeared really appear a religious inappropriate, so that even the passive resistance against these uh, cultural products could be regarded as a sign of radicalization. The definition of illegal religious uh, activities is thus broadened to include condition for defining radicalization, which leaves little room for Muslim groups to interpret uh, Islamic precepts uh, in uh, their uh, own way. Um, in this manner, the state's unita unilateral recognition of bad and good Muslims risk um, falling in what is called the no true Scotsman's fallacy, 
under which the perceived quality of religious groups is defined on the basis of universal generalization. The fallacy is here due to the fact that rather than providing evidences to qualify this generalization, the state's legal documents and the relative practices and the relative provisions um, offer other generalizations that support, support the first one. At the same time, these documents and relative provisions exclude the empirical data and the counterexamples that are able to disqualify the state's presumption on religious terrorism and the radical extremism. In fact, this living fallacy is a result of the need of, to implement the idea of the, um, the, idea of the uh, Chinese authorities uh, on the state secularism, you know, the principle of secularism, the secularism of the state, which uh, implies um, a separation between churches and the states, uh, and, and the state. In the Chinese context, uh, this uh, principle of secularism includes uh, the absolute power of the government over religion, which also justifies the intrusive uh, preventive measures against the so-called illegal uh, religious activities, which are named as such in the light of the counter, in the need to prevent, in the light of the needs to prevent counter terrorism and, you know, the uh, fundamentalism and the violent radicalization, uh, which use religion as a strategy to confront uh, with the state. That's even more contentious uh, in uh, Xinjiang, where the ethnic conflicts uh, degenerated into the world, say, people's war on terror after the 2009 Umrik, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, riots in, uh, and uh, in several attacks in inland cities um, a few years later, which has led to the state attitude to illegal religious activities of Muslim Uyghurs, uh, who constitute uh, around 40% of the Xinjiang population. Muslim Uyghurs uh, are indeed defined as underground religious uh, um, uh, you know, classes, whose uh, teaching and practices contradict the public's authorities, the China, uh, the China uh, efforts to forge political and social conformity. Not for nothing, the 2070 ordinance on radicalization classify many Uyghurs traditional practices as interferences in the state's accomplishment, accomplishments. As such, they are defined as criminal offenses. In doing so, the state denies not only the presence of a, a gray areas between good and bad Muslims, Muslims, China preventive strategy against the religion inspired terrorism, which is a problem even in China, also translates into a sort of sinicization of a religion, which aims at forging religious minority groups in order to make their teaching and practices fit with the Chinese ideas uh, on society, including the principle of secularism, the way the state treats, for example, the uh, religious minority or the religious uh, uh, denominations as a whole, as a, in general. For the same reasons, religious extremism, extremism is not only considered as a security issue, but also as a political question which constitutes a letter, which can constitute um, a legal, uh, legal obstacles to, to the possibility, to possibility for an individual to be treated as a mere believer and to enjoy freedom of religion, the principle of equality, as, which, as you know, includes the right to be different uh, even in religious issues. For the same reasons, the Chinese approach in preventing Islamic terrorism is applied in such a way that it makes it extremely difficult to discern between the private and the public spheres and between illegal and normal religious 
practices, which also ends up impacting on the efficiency of the entire counterterrorism terrorism preventing strategy. However, we should also underscore that this is very important. We should also underscore that this problem is not new at and it does not only affect China. A glance uh, at the de radicalization programs in Western Europe reveals some significant similarities in this field. For example, the preventive strategy and the program of de radicalization in the UK have been criticized for uh, their emphasis on the British value or on uh, or the Britishness. The same can be argued about France, where an experimental center for prevention, integration and citizenship has designed to reach radicalized individuals through Republican values. Moreover, after the recent or relatively recent terrorist attacks on French soil, through which, for example, the professor, professor Samuel Paty was decapitated in Paris and the three people were killed in a stabbing assault in the church of Notre Dame in Nice, President Macron announced legislation regulating, regulating anti-radicalization measures. These measures aim at targeting uh, what is called the French Islamist separatism, which uh, the opponents uh, to consider, consider the, an invention of a political propaganda. Macron has also asked, asked the, uh, that the country Muslims, um, uh, Muslim leaders accept the Republican universal principle, le principe fondateur de la République, which include the laicité de combat, which in turn could be roughly translated into militant secularism, implying, as I said, a strict separation between the state and the religious denomination, but in French also implies a sort of assimilation integration policies, especially towards Muslim, Muslim mm -hmm. communities and Muslim individuals. So, I'm going uh, on the conclusion. Um, uh, in, uh, in this sense, uh, uh, sorry, um, in this sense, um, uh, it should be noted that this approach is not only a part of the French attitude over counterterrorism. It is in fact affirmed in many European states' legislation, including the Italian ones. The example is given by a sophisticated legal system of preventive. Uh, measures which aim at protecting the public order in a face prior to the commission of a crime. It should be noted that this system is a result of a long and intense history, as you know, of a struggle against um, Italian criminal organizations such as those referring to Mafia, Camorra and uh, Andrangheta. It is uh, interesting to note that uh, given uh, it's a high um, degree of efficiency, uh, this system of uh, preventive measures has been adopted at the European Union level. It, and it is, uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is not by chance that this system is, government, uh, is governed sorry, by the anti-mafia code whose measures uh, after the terrorist attacks occurred in France, especially in France in 2015, can also be applied for, for preventing, uh, for contrasting the current form of Islamic violence, radicalization, and uh, uh, religious, uh, uh, religious uh, um, uh, terrorism. The basic idea that supports this uh, preventive uh, major system is that the protection of fundamental interests of the states, like the maintenance of a good level of security against the uh, some very important potential threats, such as terrorism, you know, justify the fact that the crime prevention should act in an earlier stage than crime um, uh, repression. In other words, the system of preventive uh, measures uh, gives the state the, the possibility to limit the constitutional rights of a person, including the right to freely 
profess a religion and to travel freely in any part of the country. And under the pressing needs, as I said, to prevent terrorism and violent radicalization, this limitation can occur even in the case the person concerned has not committed any crime. In fact, these measures can be applied through administrative acts that, as such, as you know, do not imply the same guarantees as provided by the right to a frail trial, for example, in a criminal or even a civil proceedings, which also produce an intricate paradox. If in normal circumstances some personal conducts are considered as the public manifestation of freedom of religion and expressions. Uh, so these conducts, uh, these behaviors uh, should thus be protected um, uh, at the most important as the most important constitutional rights, as the most important constitutional values, as it, it is in Italy, uh, in Europe, or in France, in the UK, you know, in the, in the so-called constitutional democracies. But in the light of the existing form of religion inspired terrorism, these same behaviors enable the state to apply stringent preventive measures that limit these same fundamental rights of individual. That is the paradox. So in conclusion, as you can see from this uh, brief, very brief uh, presentation, all the experiences coming out from the Asia Pacific region and Europe uh, in the prevention of religion inspired terrorism uh, raise some common problems. This includes the fact that this kind of terrorism as uh, are um, uh, these kinds of uh, are uh, extremely dangerous and difficult to defeat. This is because this, uh, this kind of emergency is very unpredictable because their perpetrators use their trick shots to take the police forces by surprise and from many, uh, you know, public and private areas, spaces. In this sense, like the COVID-19 pandemic emergency, the religion inspired terrorism unlines the empirical interdependencies of different parts of the world, like those referring to Europe, you know, European Union and the Asia Pacific region. In order to contrast and prevent this phenomenon, information, that is very, the, this is very important. Information between, must be shared between these two parts of the world and between com competent authorities, relative competent authorities, which also implies critical challenges that, in the light of the dignity of human beings, um, uh, may be translated into opportunities. But in order to do that, all legal system involved should engage into a clear dialogue, which implies an in-depth mutual understanding. So, in a very conclusion, in, uh, in this manner, China, for example, can learn that the prevention of a terrorist threat must necessarily uh, coexist with the respect of human rights and the constitutional prerogatives, including those related to freedom of religion and the rights of minority groups to freely profess their tradition within the limit of the public orders um, and the protection of the rights and the freedom of others. At the same time, the European Union must speak um, with a unique voice, especially in external, in external actions, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, must consider the crucial law of the collaboration with the Asia Pacific states, not only for the commercial purposes, but also for a common interest in a reasonable future, which includes the necessity of preventing all forms of global emergencies, including terrorism, failing to fight back against this multitasking internal and external forces will reduce the ability of democratic components of society to offer a compelling counter narrative, com counter -narrative of, this, of these emergencies, um, which is even more urgent in a period of uh, asymmetric fears 
asymmetric, you know, asymmetric emergencies and in a period, in a, a era of social economic uncertainties and exclusions under which the politics of fear, as I said, are very active and likely to persist. Thank you so much. I think I, I stay in the, in the time. Uh, thank you very much, Francesco. It has been a very, very interesting analysis uh, about the religious uh, uh, terrorism, right? And the counter-terrorism uh, strategies in the European Union and some European countries such as Italy, France, China, in Asia. Uh, this is a, a, real, a real threat, uh, very difficult to defeat uh, as you have point out, because of that is very important the international and in this case, the interregional, um, the interregional cooperation, right? Thank you, thank you very much. Great, so we have already eh, a lot of ideas, a lot of information, new knowledge provided by the speakers, our partners eh, about different issues um, on EU Asia Pacific relations. Uh, so now, with all this contribution, uh, we are going to open a time for, uh, for discussion and uh, for mutual dialogue. Uh, so any, uh, any participant, any attendant now uh, may address uh, any question or any comment to the speaker. Well, to that end, I will appreciate if you first, please, uh, put your hands up, you may at the bottom of the screen, uh, you may uh, click on a hand just to ask for uh, for intervention, right? And then I will appreciate um, if uh, any person want to address any question, please open your camera, uh, open your microphone, of course, and introduce yourself very briefly uh, and address the question or the comment to any of the speakers. So. Well, we open now this time for discussion. So here at the bottom, um, well, mine is in Spanish. Uh, it is indicated reactions, and you may click on a hand <laughs> to ask for intervention. Well, while we wait for some question, ah, here we have a question. Uh, here we have a question, Belen. Garcia Noblejas, good morning. Good morning. Thank Please. you very much. Um, so thank you very much for all the presentations and for this opportunity. Uh, some of us will be presenting tomorrow, so it's a very good opportunity for us. So um, I am especially interested on the aspect of counter-terrorism cooperation between the European Union and China. So... Um, I would like to, to ask uh, to, uh, sorry, I cannot read the, the whole surname, but Francesco, <laughs> thank you very much. So um, as I, I, I was interested in knowing from your perspective and your research, uh, the kind of cooperation that there is at this moment between China and the European Union, uh, what is it about at this moment, if, we, if you know, and also how that, how that is affected by the conceptualization of the threat itself. Say in China, we've got the three evil forces, right? Or the origin of separatism, extremism, and terrorism in a single term, uh, which is the three evil forces. So how does this original perception in China of the threat affects or may affect the, the collaboration, maybe more pragmatic co collaboration, if that makes sense? So, so what is your view in this aspect? Thank you very much. Very well. Can I? 
Yes, thank you. So I think this question is for you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Belen. Um, uh, it's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, I think, as I said, uh, there is a, a different perception uh, between, uh, you know, if you look at, uh, if you look at the, 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 the conception of terrorism, within the European Union, there is a common understanding. There is no common understanding about what is the religion is by terrorism. That's a problem. The European Union, uh, since the 9-11 the, um, the, uh, tragedy, has issued many legal documents in order to harmonize you know, a common understanding about the terrorism. This is the first step in order to have a, an efficient uh, counter-terrorism, an efficient counter-terrorism, which includes, this is very important, the process of radicalization. Because we have it here, and, uh, uh, to face uh, the relationship between terrorism and the religion. That's the problem. What is the real, the uh, empirical relationship between, for example, Islam as a religion, and uh, we know that there is an important difference, there are important differences between, for example, in terms of uh, structure, in terms of theological sense between Islam as a religion and the other important religion, such as uh, Catholicism and the Jewish. Because in Islam, uh, within the uh, Muslim world, there is a unique structure. There is a, a chief, like, for example, the Pope for uh, Catholics. There are many um, uh, uh, religious organizations. This makes it difficult to understand the real the real relationship between Islam and uh, as a religion and the terrorism. That's the problem. And for this reason, we face many problems in order to define what is, what religion inspired terrorism really implies. That's mm -hmm. the problem. But in, uh, um, about the relationship between, and this, this is the, this perception, this problem, we can find also in China. We can find also in uh, because we are we have uh, to face this international, as I said, a global, uh, a globalized um, uh, um, uh, uh, international threat like the terrorism. In China, um, uh, China is very active in preventing terrorism. Mm -hmm. so this is important because you know um, uh, uh, in China um, uh, can use uh, there is. Um, I would I would have uh, a question. There is a, a strict relationship. There is a, a worrying, um, uh, you know, uh, problem about uh, uh, the human rights protections, like in the uh, European Union, uh, in the preventing uh, preventing terrorist threat. We also we have also to consider the protection of religion, for example, freedom of religion. Um, uh, about the relationship, the collaboration at the level of the official, um, uh, uh, you know, authorities, there is no collaboration. But if you look at some documents, you know, the intelligences, um, even uh, around the world, including China, and collaborate, collaborate with, uh, with uh, each other in order to understand, in order to understand how to prevent this global problem. Um, so um, in the future, as I said in the, last, uh, um, in the last part of my intervention, uh, this collaboration is very important. It's very important uh, because there are, uh, as the collaboration is important in order to prevent, to contrast the COVID-19 emergency, you know, is a global problem. And in this case, uh, this collaboration is important also in order to understand that, for example, um, uh, China can learn from this collaboration that uh, an efficient uh, preventive strategy against the terrorism, Islamic terrorism, implies a coexistence of protection of human rights. This is very important. The European Union, on the other hand, uh, must learn that uh, the collaboration with the ASEAN region 
is very important not only in the com for commercial issues, but also with these very important issues like those referring to the terrorism threat and the COVID-19 emergency, which are not strictly related to the commercial or economic issues, but can have an important impact as the, the previous, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the previous uh, speaker can have an important uh, um, impact even in this field. Very well. Uh, we have two, two other questions. I think that the first hand is from Anna Gascon. Anna? Um, yeah, hi. Um, actually, Actually, I have a couple of questions, if it's not too much. Um, I wanted first to ask uh, Professor Hajime Imamura, because he has said that there is this huge problem of uh, human resources in or the human factor in Japan. And then he has gone on to explain um, the problems with uh, organizations and the hierarchy modes and so on, but uh, he has not maybe spoke a lot about the solutions to the human uh, factor problem. And in my opinion for innovation, one of the first things that you have to do is to bring different people to the table. And in that sense, I think that Japan uh, has like a big cultural problem and also a legal problem somehow uh, bringing these people to the table, I mean, bringing women to the back to the job market after having children and also attracting talent from abroad because they have a super strict immigration policy. And if you want more people, you have to change first the culture and then the law. And I would like him maybe uh, to talk to us a little bit about this, if it's possible. And then I have a question for uh, Professor uh, Xia Tong Sang, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce the, the name well, um, because he has said that uh, we are burdening trade talks with a lot of other topics like human rights and environment and so on. And I can understand how the EU in the past has used trade talks uh, to you know, reach different objectives that are not really related uh, to trade as such, just using their leverage in their uh, negotiations to get other things. But I, I'm very interested in uh, how you regulate uh, electronic commerce. And in this uh, topic in particular, I think that there is a big overlap between human rights and trade talks, because now we are speaking a lot about data localization, free flow of data and so on. And there, I think that whatever you regulate in the trade talks has a huge impact on human rights. So I would like him if he can give us some kind of um, reaction on that. Uh, and thank you very much. Okay, so Thank you very much, Anna, for a very uh, serious <laughs> question. And uh, uh, very briefly, uh, speaking the Japanese history, uh, uh, there was a Meiji Revolution, 1868 or something. And uh, there are two ways to catch up with the, uh, the Western developing countries. One is that uh, democratic uh, way, something like EU are now taking. The other way is more top-down bureaucratic way. So uh, as you mentioned that the current situation with Japanese human resource uh, problem is that because of we took the top-down bureaucratic, very speedy catch up to the European countries. But uh, uh, because of that, we lost some sort of the diversity or more democratic uh, way of uh, construction of the society. So <clears throat> it is true that uh, even for the digital transformation, Japan is a bit far behind of the, not only US and Europe, but also that China is now developing very quickly. And uh, 
I should say this is because of our big success of 1980s. And uh, Japan was uh, Japanese labor management, human resource management system was very much successful. I under the lifetime employment system and uh, very closed uh, innovation system. I think that you know that uh, Japan is something like, uh, uh, I, I will show you that here, sorry. Uh, here. Yes, I show you that uh, the, the that open innovation and the closed innovation. So uh, that do you know that Sharp, the the electricity company Sharp, is now owned by Taiwanese capital, and then the failure of the Sharp Sharp industry is because of the closed innovation system and lifetime employment systems. So. Uh, we need more open and uh, uh, all, uh, the more flexible employment system for this, but uh, the, we are too much uh, get used to the, the traditional uh, employment system. That I will show you that uh, uh, there are so many uh, old age people are occupying Japanese decision making system. So. Most of the influential people in the business world is more than 70 years old or something. So uh, their experience is very much old fashioned. So very good way is that the, to, uh, to let, get away from the Japanese uh, uh, decision making system, but uh, uh, elderly, elderly generations, generations are still occupying the Japanese uh, society. So. Uh, uh, that uh, this is some so uh, let me let me say that our strategy is something like a Trojan horse system. So we provide the motive, more entrepreneurship minded and independent young people into Japanese uh, business society, and uh, we change uh, this young people into more like something like a Trojan horse and maybe uh, the, the destroy from inside the society. So the aim of our department is something like that, but uh, it takes a little bit of time. But uh, uh, in other words, Japanese society is too much rigidly constructed because of the success of the high economic growth in 1970 and 1980. But it's true that at, if we uh, lost this chance of changing our human management system, Japan will be uh, lost. We lost the chance to catch up with the uh, developing uh, uh, US and the EU and Chinese economy. So it's a very dangerous situation in Japan. It's true. Thank you. I think the second question was for Shatoshi. Uh, for me, yeah. I think it's uh, about uh, electrical uh, commerce um, and how to regulate uh, this. Uh, on the ground of human rights. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to say um, China's uh, uh, e-commerce are developing very fast, uh, represented by uh, Alibaba and, uh, and Tencent. So we have uh, uh, offensive uh, interests in, in trade negotiations. That means we want to have more and more uh, overseas market. So, we see um, um, a strong need to strike a balance uh, between offensive business interests and uh, the need to, to regulate e-commerce because this is something very new. Um, 10 years ago, uh, it's not so obvious. Uh, only in the United States, they have a strong offensive interests, but in recent years, uh, China has very strong offensive interests in international trade and investment. Uh, negotiations. Um, I think that there are specific provisions in trade and trade uh, agreement uh, governing um, human rights. Generally speaking, it's within the, the provision of sustainable uh, development. I don't know whether there are specific human rights provision within the chapter of, of e-commerce. I need to go back to, to uh, specific trade agreements to, to check out. 
Um, I think that, 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 that really we need to be very careful in, in regulating uh, because at the end of the day on the market, these uh, business people who, who do business, um, if you don't regulate, uh, there's a problem. If you regulate too much, <laughs> there's an, another type of, 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 of problem. Um, finally, uh, my, my response is that we, we need to strike a balance between uh, trade and human rights. I think that, uh, my bottom line is that uh, we cannot burden trade with too many things. Uh, otherwise, trade doesn't run. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shatom. Uh, we have uh, one more question, maybe the last one before we conclude uh, from Anna Borodina. Anna, please. Yes, hello everyone, dear colleagues, another Anna, <laughs> uh, this time from Russia, and uh, thank you so much. Anna, uh, we cannot hear you. Um, can you hear me now? Aura, yes, now. <laughs> so once again, thank you for an opportunity to participate in this conference as a listener. And I'm at Tver State University, and it's also part of the Erasmus Plus team. We are now implementing the project on work-based learning in high education in Armenia and Russia, and also other international European partners are involved. I have uh, two questions, a question to Professor Holland and Professor Imamura. So a question to Professor Holland. Um, when you mentioned that research on uh, perceptions and expectations in Asian and um, Pacific region of uh, the European Union and European countries. Uh, did you focus on uh, media, right? And um, were they, let's say, um, paper media, like hard copies or electronic ones? And was there any difference between perceptions and expectations and opinions uh, published in? let's say, based on different genres and political orientation of those um, media and maybe social media, maybe they are more critical. So um, it would be great to learn the, about the difference, if any, those perceptions. And the question to Professor Imamura is, um, you know, we spoke about perceptions that J uh, Japanese model of uh, economic development and business and management has been perceived in Russia at Russian universities at the departments of economics and management as very successful and effective. And it has always been told as a specific case uh, of uh, success. And yes, I totally agree that we mainly focused on big businesses. And now, as I understood from your presentation, uh, there is like a shift towards another revision of this model, perhaps, right? In terms of um, making it more horizontal, maybe more open, adjusting it to, um, let's say, European models. And you also mentioned that Meiji time, right? When uh, Japan had to catch up, or maybe, maybe not to catch up, maybe to develop, right, in this direction. So uh, if possible, could you please uh, focus a little bit more on that? What is happening with, um, the famous uh, Japanese model of business and management. Thank you very much. Okay, Martin, maybe you are the first to answer. Thank, thank you. Can you hear me okay without the headset? Yes. Good. Good. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I can answer both, I guess, historically, because we've been doing this sort of work for 20 years, but also as in last year in 2020. Um, certainly, when we look at the traditional printed media, um, there is, um, I guess you could say the journalists have more space and time to develop expectations towards the EU. I mean, I think that's a clear pattern that if you are looking for messages in public diplomacy, then the traditional media that might be on the internet as a PDF, but the traditional media is the place where you will find uh, some expectations and perceptions uh, being quite well uh, articulated. Conversely, uh, it might seem, might seem odd or counterintuitive, uh, in social media, whether it's 
Twitter or Weibo or uh, Facebook, all the various ones we've looked at in uh, 2020, as well as previously. Um, I guess the best I can say is it's it's vacuous go gossip and it, it's it's an internal bubble. There's no communic there's no dialogue, shall we say? Because the don't forget what we're interested in and what the EU is using these media for is to convey public diplomacy messages. And it wants to give its message, but it also needs to listen to how that message is being received. And frankly, I think social media in sense of our analysis of how the EU's messages are being listened to uh, is that they're being completely ignored in, in that regard. It's not a productive dialogue of, of public diplomacy. Uh, which I think is you know, counter counterintuitive for most people, given that social media is meant to open up and democratize and encourage participation and therefore generate um, real expectations from citizens, uh, we see virtually no evidence of that at all. So it's still the traditional media uh, that uh, plays to the EU's role in the world. And uh, perhaps I should have begun the whole talk by reminding everyone, if you need reminding, uh, that the EU uh, is very vain. Vanity, this is about vanity. It wants to be recognized. It wants to explain to EU taxpayers in, in Spain and Italy and elsewhere uh, that the EU is wisely spending its money in public diplomacy overseas to enhance its credibility and that European messages, values are being at least listened to or heard and hopefully adopted. So I'm afraid uh, my message is rather a disappointing one. Yeah. Okay. Ahime, Thank you. Yeah. Ahime. Yes. Please. So uh, please look at this uh, picture. So uh, this is a picture I showed you that uh, a Japanese management system is used to be a right hand side. This is a, some integral architecture. So uh, every process of Japanese business management is precisely connected uh, in, inside the big company. And uh, Japanese businessmen is very much uh, have difficulty to move across the border of the company or across the border of the, uh, maybe that the country or so. But how do you think that the left hand side is some sort of the modular type of technology? So it is a, a very flexible and convertible in any, every kind of the materials. So uh, this is very flexible and open and uh, you can overcross the border. So uh, I will stop there. <laughs> so, that uh, the Japanese management, the problem with the Japanese management is that uh, the big, uh, the top, top management of the Japanese big company do not realize the problem of the current situation, how serious Japanese business is facing. So uh, another key word is that the middle ground. Middle ground is that the connecting the startups, young uh, venture businesses to big businesses. So I talked to the Hitachi, vice president of Hitachi, and uh, I recommended him to open up the, the horizontal connection with the small businesses or the, some other companies, but he, he rejected because Hitachi is very much aware that the uh, top down, uh, some sort of the uh, closed innovation systems. One example is that the railway stage, railway businesses, uh, the train businesses. So Hitachi is very much successful in EU, uh, sorry, in UK, that uh, he, he, Hitachi got a very big market in UK because in UK, that uh, train, train industry is uh, so much fragmented into small horizontal parts. So Hitachi is still confident in the uniting the top-down kind of the business uh, connection. So I think that the uh, Japanese management system is not uh, uh, effective anymore, but uh, we need some more flexi horizontal flexibility for the management. So if we compare that uh, Toshiba and Hitachi, Hitachi had a crisis 10 years ago. So 
uh, they are now opening up and buying buying small uh, businesses into the Hitachi business. But uh, Toshiba is still uh, stick to the uh, some closed uh, internal connection. So that so you see that the difference. So the re result is a very apparent. And also Sharp has a failure of say they stick to the uh, closed uh, innovation system. So problem is that the openness of the mindset of the business people in Japan. So uh, everything. So for example, that the Japanese management system is uh, or government system is uh, done by paper. <laughs> there are many, many papers. So we are very much difficult to digitalize because that the rule of the paper management system is that uh, not compatible horizontal. So, so that the Japanese digital transformation is really serious <laughs> for for changing the business situation. That's one example. So uh, basically that the human resource uh, uh, revolution or, or changing is, a, I think that it's the most uh, uh, facet way, royal road to change the Japanese business system, but uh, it's, it takes a time. So- Okay, thank you very much, Ahime. Uh, uh, Beatrice. Don't you mind if I share just one funny case about Hitachi, <laughs> as uh, Professor Imamura mentioned? May I? Just very short. Yes, very short. Yes, because. Uh, so, yes, in my area, which is a Tver area, it's um, almost close to Moscow. Uh, Hitachi uh, actually implemented an excavator building plant. Fine. Uh, very good plant. Um, local people involved, employed, perfect. And a couple of years ago, um, after they implemented this pr that project, it was a green field, so very successful. Uh, Hitachi decided to um, do something with the railways also. And I translated because, as, well, it was in Japanese, it was English. And uh, when I mentioned to people from the railway department of Hitachi that there is already a successful case of developing business in Russia and in this particular area, uh, by excavator building builders, they were, you know, they didn't know anything about that. It was such a huge company that they didn't really know what one what what branches did actually in a different field. You know, it was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope it helps. So it's so it was so big that it didn't have any feedback from its local branches. And indeed, mm. you're right in terms of horizontal interaction. So the railways didn't know about this uh, earth moving thing. So hope it will it will be a good anecdote yes. for you to to share. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So yes, thank you. So that the problem is that the, the, the Japanese big business is still confident to the closed uh, innovation system, but contrary okay. to that, the uh, co Korean business dispatches the uh, young people to the uh, the unknown uh, uh, the areas, and that that, that that this is kind of the feedback from the market. So that uh, we have to change the mindset of the big business uh, companies. Yeah, that's true. Thank you very much for this fruitful dialogue. Um, we have to conclude because time is over. I think Francisco, uh, I have read your chat very in the chat, your message very. very yeah, if, did you want to make a question? Sorry, I, I have. Yeah, I just a question uh, if there is a there is a time. Uh, and a brief oh, question. We are, we are out of time, but. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, no. okay. Okay, but uh, just for uh, Martin Holland, for uh, uh, it's uh, it's about uh, do you think uh, the the European Union leadership should engage in more active uh, affirmative actions about the perceptions like those referring to Israel, for example? And do you think it's about only a question of perception because we have in Europe within the Europe? a problem about the perception about the European, the European Union. You know, it has become a sort of the scapegoat uh, for the, the, governmental, uh, the governmental leadership uh, in order to, uh, to justify some lack of uh, uh, evidence. I'll, I'll reply very quickly. Uh, well, six years ago, I was contracted by the External Action Service to undertake a study on, on how they were being understood in globally, actually, uh, in 10 strategic partners. Uh, and uh, I think our conclusion from that was is that the problem for the EU is that it over promises and under delivers. It must stop over promising uh, 
to be the solution or the leading light, choose your topic, uh, because it fails really uh, to, uh, to do that too often. And that's a question of credibility. So uh, some modesty, some more modesty and uh, by von der Leyen and others, I think, is the solution to better public diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. This has been, uh, we are out of time. We have to conclude for today. Uh, it has been uh, very, very interesting, both the contribution from the speakers and, and the feedback, the questions uh, from the audience. So we really thank you uh, to all of you, the speaker for their contribution and the attendance for your interest and active involvement. And we encourage you to join us uh, tomorrow at the same time in Europe and in Asia Pacific, uh, when we shall continue to, to discuss and to learn more things about the European Union Asia Pacific relations. Thank you very much and Thank hope you. to see you tomorrow.